So we're getting toward the end, to the end of our series called One and Many, Unity and Diversity in the Body of Christ. And today we're going to get practical. We're going to talk about some practical ways that we can um, exercise this unity, even in and especially in difficult times and difficult conversations. But first, a listening test. I want to do a little exercise based on a current phenomenon on a, pop on a popular social media site. Someone posted a sound clip of a voice saying the word laurel. But the way that the sound was mixed, many people who listened to the word thought it was saying yanny. And you'll hear what I'm talking about in just a few moments, or maybe you won't. Now, this one little sound clip has people disagreeing, and many of you are probably thinking right now, man, there are too many people with way too much time on their hands. <laughs> That's what I think when I hear this stuff. It's like, who, who sat there? Like, okay, anyway. Okay, so I'm going to play this little sound clip for you, all right? And, and I want you to tell me what you hear, okay? Let me pull that up. Uh, let's see. That. Okay, so I'm going to play this sound clip for you. And, and tell me what you hear. Tell me if you hear the voice saying, Laurel. Or if you hear the voice saying, Yanny. Laurel or Yanny, okay? You got it? Here we go. It All right, we're going to try it again. Maybe because it shut the sound down. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'm going to open up the sound. Here we go. Let's try it again. Okay, it's it's just playing out of the I want you all to be able to hear this. All right? This is Otherwise, you're not going to be up with, you know, the, the most recent internet phenomenon, and, and you're going to feel out of it, and then you're going to be like, Pat, why didn't the pastor tell us about this? Nobody told us about this. I'm out of the loop. So we don't want that. All right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, now you know the password. Okay, here we go. Laurel. 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 Okay, how many of you hear Laurel. 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 How many of you hear the voice Yanny. saying Yanny? Yanny. Wow, Yanny. a lot of Yannies. Okay. Yanny. So, Yanny. for those of you who hear Laurel, Yanny. Laurel. Yanny. You hear, how many hear Laurel Yanny. again? See if Yanny. it changes when I do this. Any Yannies? Any, any yeah, laurels convert to Yannies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laylee, oh. Okay. Yeah, how, many, how about yeah, those of you who hear Yanny? Yeah, okay. Yeah, now, you, now you're hearing Laurel, right? Yeah, Weird, right? Okay, but if you still hear Yanny. Yeah, Laurel. Laurel. Oh, Laurel, Laurel comes to life. All Laurel. right. Laurel. Yanny. Yeah. Yanny. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Kind of cool. So now you are up to speed with the latest internet sensation. Congratulations. And I promise you it'll be something different by this afternoon. This is a really innocent, simple, silly way of illustrating something that is actually very serious, a very difficult and pressing need within the church today and really in the entire world I know this is, seems like just a simple kind of sound exercise. In just the past couple weeks, we have seen many big, important, and violent things happen in our world. We've seen the establishment of the American Embassy in Jerusalem where 62 Palestinian people were killed. We uh, saw the bombing of Christian churches in Indonesia, where 13 people were killed. We saw yet another, another school shooting, which left 10 people dead. And just yesterday, four gunmen attacked a church in Russia, killing three. All told, with just those incidences mentioned, if you're keeping count, that's 87 lives. And I'm sure there is more that has happened hard to keep track. You know, the incidences in particular are significant, 
especially for the church, because they all bring up issues that are, they can be controversial and divisive. And we as part of the church, we are not immune to the controversy and the divisiveness. We are not immune to all of these things that continue to happen. You know, based on where we stand and what we believe that we hear on these issues, whether from God or from our own consciousness, we can most often find it hard to hear anything else other than our perspective on these things. And not only do we find it hard to hear things the way that someone else does, but we find it hard to believe that anyone could hear things any other way than the way that we do. How could you possibly hear Laurel? How could you possibly hear Yanni? It is so obvious. It's silly when you think of it as a soundbite. It becomes very serious when it becomes real life events. Speaking for myself, I can say that the hardest thing to do when it comes to the convictions that I hold to deeply and tightly, the hardest thing for me to do is to even think about sliding into the frequency of someone who, does, who, who holds an opposing view. I can't hear it. I just don't want to hear it. And even though it only serves to make me angrier, and even though it does nothing to bring understanding or peace, I would often rather stay where I am than try to see things as those people do. In my estimation, I would say that most people agree, including Christians, we usually go one of two directions. We either go to arguing or avoiding. We go to arguing or avoiding. It's also known as fight or flight, right? We, we either pick fights, complete with name calling and hateful thoughts, or we go completely silent even when there are many among us in church who are begging us, asking us as the church, please address this. Talk about this. Many times as a church, we just don't. But don't take my word for it. Uh, in 2016, a Barna report, I know not everybody really likes Barna, but they have some interesting information. There was a Barna report that shows this is what they said, this splintering and polarization of American culture has made it more difficult than ever to have a good conversation, just a simple good conversation because of the polarizing views and opinions in our, in our country, in our world. It goes on to say, evangelicals particularly seem to have a particularly difficult time talking to those outside their group. They report higher tensions than any other group when it comes to having conversations with those who are different from them. What it shows is well over half of the evangelical Christians polled, over half, well over half, said that they would have difficulty carrying on a normal conversation with a Muslim person, with an atheist person, with a person from the LGBT community. It's not really surprising, but it is a little discouraging. But this tragedy worsens when we realize that for many Christians, we treat each other, fellow Christians, as though well, we were part of that different crowd. And we often resolve that we are either going to go to war or simply avoid and ignore you altogether. Church, I want to put a challenge to you today. We can no longer settle for just those two choices. We can no longer settle for the choices of fight or flight, argue or avoid. There are monumental things happening in our world. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, and some of them, well, we're not really sure yet. And oftentimes, the church gets lost either in the bitter debate or in the complete silence, and that's not where we want to be. So I want to offer a third option today. It's not going to be easy. It will take prayer. It will take mental and emotional preparation. It will take courage and audacity. But this option, I believe, is one that needs to take place more and more, and it needs to start with us, God's people. So what is this third option? It's something that John Wesley, long time ago dude, who uh, I will introduce a little bit more later, this is something John Wesley called holy conversation or holy conference. 
What is holy conversation and how is it helpful and why is it the best of the three options? We're going to find out today. For our church, this is going to be, this is hugely important because we ourselves are going through a tough time. Right? Our church board presented a lead pastor candidate. We voted, the majority voted for him, but there was a strong minority who voted no, indicating to our leadership that we are not on the same page. And regardless of how you voted or how you felt, you're completely entitled to your opinion. This is why we have votes, right? So that people can express their convictions. That 18% of the overall no vote spoke loud and clear. The question is, how do we move forward from that? Do we argue? Do we try to prove our own points and make sure that our opinions rise above the rest? Do we just not talk about it? fearing that even bringing it up could cause division and bitterness. No, there are things that we need to talk about. And when the time is right, we should talk about this. To find out what people really are and were feeling. To decide together that we are going to move forward as unified as we can be. But there's a healthy way to go about it, and of course there's an unhealthy way. So let's learn to engage today in holy conversation. Before we go any further, we need to make sure that we understand from the scriptures why arguing and avoiding are not usually the most suitable options and why holy conversation is. So let's go back to our passage in 1 Corinthians, which is the letter from the Apostle Paul. We've exa been examining that over the last few weeks. Paul is writing to the people of a church that he planted. He planted this church. He started, he founded the church, right? Right? He's writing to these people in the city of Corinth, and historians, Bible historians will estimate that it was about 18 months after Paul left that church to go plant other churches or go to other workplaces to minister, 18 months after he left, which is when these arguments and divisions started to rise. After his greetings and his affirmations in the letter, he opens his discourse with an appeal, begging the church in Corinth. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And he was specifically, again, as I explained a couple weeks ago, he was specifically talking about how they viewed their leaders. Don't put any leader on a pedestal. You are not of Paul. You are not of Apollos. You are not of... Rick Warren, you're not of T.D. Jakes, you're not of Joel Osteen, you're not of, of uh, I don't know, whatever. You're not of that. You are of Christ. Being in Christ, being of Christ, that is what unifies us. Don't get lost in all these other distractions. Another translation, the New Living Translation uh, reads this way. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. And here it is in the message version, which is not a translation. It's like a paraphrase of scripture using modern language. It says, I have a serious concern to bring up with you, my friends, using the authority of Jesus, our master. I'll put it as urgently as I can. You must get along with each other. You must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. No matter how you slice it or dice it, we are being called toward radical unity in the church. I say radical because unity doesn't always make sense, does it? How can I possibly be unified with that person? How can I possibly be one with that? No, no, you know, no I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to go there. It is radical. So this is why in chapter 12 of this letter, Paul addresses the difficulty of this unity. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Just as a body, he says, though it is one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. Yes, you are to be one, but it is a reality that we are many. Yes, you are many, but it is a reality that you must be one. 
It's not either or. It's both. We are many, but we must be one. Must. Christ and those who are in Christ cannot be divided. They must be one. There can be no other way or option. But why, you may ask, why does this mean that I can't just argue when I want to argue? Why can't I just avoid people when I want to avoid them? And I'll mention this at the end, but sometimes arguing and avoiding, there's a time for that. There's a time for fighting. There's a time for just being quiet. I mean, maybe I can really create unity by fighting and proving my point. Just persuade as many people as I can to agree with me. Some of you are really good at argument and persuasion. Right? You can talk circles around people, get them to agree with you, even if they don't really agree with you, but they just, okay, okay, stop talking. I'll agree with you. Some of you may feel like that, right? Or what better way to keep the unity than to just not talk about things ever? Oh, sure, I never really learned to listen to others, and I never really have a chance to open myself up to anyone else, but if I never say anything of what I'm thinking or what I really believe to anybody else, and I never give them a chance to tell me, then problem solved. Just don't talk about it. You know, as a pastor, when I examine the scriptures and I prepare to share with you as my church family, my approach is not usually to just pick a topic and then find a bunch of scriptures that support my topic or my point. And I say that because I'm about to share a bunch of scriptures with you. But I didn't just gather a bunch of scriptures to prove the point I want to make. The, the, the truth is that I could only find scriptures that prove, I mean, that I could only find scriptures about one way of dealing with conflict. And, and it doesn't look good for those of us who always want to resort to arguing or avoiding. There is nothing, at least nothing that I could find, about fighting to prove a point, And there is no such thing in scripture about just avoiding the people that you agree, disagree with. But that's hard, isn't it? To live that way, right? Don't you feel sometimes that there are issues that are worth fighting for? And there are. Or maybe if you, some of you feel that there, it's always better to just keep quiet. Some of you may have grown up in a family like that, right? And you've continued that in your life where serious things can be happening, but you just don't talk about it. There could be abuse in a family or, or mental illness or something that's happening, but we, but we just don't talk about it. And that's kind of just the way that you do things, right? You just don't talk about it. So maybe that's... Maybe you're used to that. And Je Jesus, Jesus had so many of these, so many, how many of these mic drop moments, right? Where, where his accusers, they were trying to trick him or trying to find some fault, and he would just devastate them with his responses, right? Just leave them speechless. And sometimes I feel like I wish I could just drop a truth bomb on the people who oppose me. Boom, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> Nothing to say. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and yet... When it comes to the letters of the apostles to the early Christians, as they were figuring out what does it mean to follow Jesus in this context where we live, we constantly see the authors of the letters calling people to a better way, a most excellent way. So here are some of the things I found in the scriptures that instruct on how to deal with conflict and address the opposers. In the letter to the Ephesians, Chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, this is what Paul says. For he himself, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made the two groups, divided groups, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Wow. I mean, this by itself, right? Right? How can it be possible that we would have unity in church when so many of us are so different? We've landed. Jesus Christ, through the cross, through his sacrifice, has eradicated the walls, the dividing walls of hostility. I think for me, one of the questions that immediately comes to my mind is then why is there still so much hostility? What happened? We can still choose hostility, right? And we do. Later on in Ephesians, verse, four, verse 32, he says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There is no forgiveness. This concept of forgiveness, grace, right? This radical grace, forgiveness. Jesus Christ is the ultimate picture of that. So he says, forgive each other just as Christ has forgiven. Everything Christ has forgiven you. You can forgive each other. Even when you feel like you are so wrong right now. 
There is a way. In his letter to the church of Rome, chapter 15, verses 5 through 7, Paul says this. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. But what does it take to have that one mind and one voice? It takes endurance, doesn't it? You have to really long suffer with people. You have to really choose love over and over and over again. And it takes encouragement because I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel discouraged when I see disharmony, disunity, even hatred and hostility within the church between brothers and sisters in Christ. It is discouraging to the very core of my being. And I'm sure it is for many of you too. There's another scripture in, uh, in 1 Peter, uh, chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, where he, where he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. This is talking specifically about how to, how to address people who are not believers. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But how are we to do this? Do this with what? Gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Of course, there's a whole context story behind what was happening at that time, why he even had to tell them that. Consider those words, gentleness, respect. And then this one, Philippians chapter 2. All right? This, this is where he, he says... Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others in your relationships with others. Have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Are you getting the idea? The early church leaders were calling the early Christians to be uncommonly gracious under fire, whether they were interacting with fellow believers or not. And as they acknowledged many times, they believed this was possible for those who were submitted to the person of Jesus Christ by having the same mind as Jesus Christ. And that word gentleness is really important too, right? Because that, this, is one of, this is one of about, of when I shared with you that word gentleness in 1 Peter, it's one of about eight times gentleness or gentle is used throughout the letters of the apostles to the early church. Gentleness was so important, right? Yes, talk, address people, but do it with gentleness. What a high calling, isn't it? To be able to imitate Jesus Christ in the way we treat others. What a high calling it is to be able to imitate Jesus Christ in the way that we address people who are so different from us, people that we oppose, that oppose us, that are, that are on the opposite sides of the spectrums, spectra that we find ourselves on. Uh, in preparing for this message, I read another book, um, aside from my primary resource, which is the Bible. This book is called A Charitable Discourse, talking about the things that divide us by a, uh, a man named Dan Boone. By the way, yes, he is a descendant of the American pioneer Daniel Boone, that's why, hence the name. Um, he is currently the president of Trevecca Nazarene University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I heard him speak at this conference that I went to in March, um, and he shared some stories about some real tough decisions that he's had to make in his time in leadership. Decisions that might surprise you, actually, coming from a lifetime Nazarene, conservative, Bible Belt, white male. Things that he has had to do on behalf of his student body that made other people in the church really upset. So upset that they would go on social media and blast him and call him names and threaten him and his family. Other Christians. So angered by decisions that he made on behalf of the school that he leads that he would be threatened and had names flung at him. 
In his book, he gives lots of tips for how to and how not to engage in holy conversation or what he calls charitable discourse. And he attempts to apply some of those tips to some real and controversial issues that Christians deal with. For example, women in pastoral leadership, human sexuality, science and religion, politics and the church. Now, whether you feel that any or all of these shouldn't even be an issue on whatever end of the spectrum, that's not really the point. The point is that there are people Christians and non-Christians who will disagree with you. So it's helpful to know how do I engage with people who disagree with me in a way that is reflective of Christ. What I appreciate about uh, this author is that he's open about where he stands on certain issues, his political affiliations, the tradition from which he comes. But, but he shows that he is more than open to understanding, being wanting to understand, and hearing from people on the other side of wherever he is. You can't say that about everybody, right? That's not true of everyone. He sounds like somebody in his writing, he sounds like somebody that I could sit down and have a conversation with about any or all of these topics, but not because we agree. Some of the things that he writes about, the positions that he takes, I don't agree with. But he sounds like somebody that I could actually sit down and have a conversation, a charitable discourse with, because he's willing to hear, he's willing to listen, he's willing to learn and understand people on the opposite side from where he is. It's amazing the doors that open for holy conversation when you have two parties that are willing to discover that third option. Now, this book is primarily about how Christians interact with one another, which I think is important. It's an important distinction to make, right? Yes, of course, Christians need to examine how we interact with people who do not believe in Jesus Christ. As many of you probably would agree with me that many Christians have morals uh, and convictions and values just like non-Christians do. I've even met some non-Christians whose values and lifestyle look more like Jesus than some Christians that I've met. And some of you probably know what I'm talking about. So um, what I'm trying to say is that it's not true that, that you know, people who profess to be Christians have the, cor- the, the market cornered on values and morals, and, right? This doesn't work that way. But it's important for us to start by talking about how do we as Christians interact with each other because it has to start with us, church. It has to start with us. We have to be able and willing as a church family to, to walk through and talk through difficult times and difficult conversations. We have to be willing to do that. And in doing that, we reflect Christ. We are a family, and we need to learn how to engage with each other. So first, I want to, exp- I want to share with you some of the things that this author, Dan Boone, explains are not helpful for Christians to do with one another. When we interact with each other about difficult topics, here are some things that you do not want to do. Okay? These are the things to avoid. First, labeling. So hard, isn't it? To not label. Oh, you're just saying that because you're a conservative. Oh, you're just saying that because you're a liberal. Oh, you're just saying that because you, you're right. Now, now, if somebody comes and says, like, hey, I'm a communist, then, I mean, I guess it's okay for you to say, hey, this is my communist friend or whatever, because yeah, he said it, right? Okay? I, if he even knows what that means. And then you have a serious talk with him. Hey, but, like, if someone says that they are something, then, I mean, go ahead and interact with them on that level. But a lot of times what we do, right, is we, we come up with our own labels. Oh, you sound like a, and we just, that's it. Now I've labeled you. And you are in the box. It's natural, right? We like to put people in boxes. We like to put labels on people so we can know how to categorize. Okay, yeah, you're over there, you're in this category, and you're with me, right? We want to know how to do that, right? So we, we like to use labels. And it's, oh, today, I mean, it's so hard not to in these days. So hard not to label people like, oh, you're this, you're that. You're, so that's why. Can we try? Can we ask God to help us? Please stop with the labeling. Second thing he says to avoid is believing lies, to, to not be people of any kind of lie. You know, people who were, people who were born into overtly racist families, people who were born into families that are, for example, you know, supportive of the KKK or whatever, right? And they, they, they grow up believing this lie or, or, or people who, who, you know, families, kids who grew up in, in the, uh, you know, Westboro Baptist Church and they believe that this is the way that you deal with conflict, right? You go to, you protest at people's funerals and things like that, right? Like that's really good, that's a Christ-like thing to do. 
you, you grow up in an environment where, you, where all you know is the lie, right? And what, what Dan Boone is saying is that we need to combat, we need to identify what are those things that I've grown up with, what are those things that I've been surrounded with for so long that I've believed and it's become part of me. What are those things that I need to shed, that I need to leave behind, that I need to cast off? Don't be people of the lie. Don't create enemies. We, we, love, we love to create enemies. Again, kind of along the same lines as the labeling, right? But we, 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 we want to know who's with us, who's against us. Are you an enemy and who's not? And what happens when we create enemies is that we are a lot, that, that opens us up to speak harsh words, that opens us up to even speak curses. And I don't mean curses as in like, you know, which, like, you know, double, double, toilet, trouble kind of thing. But like, like, like we, we, we speak things over somebody like, I, you know, may you never, I, I, you know, I hate, I wish you would, but I, you know, it'd be better if you were never, I wish you were just gone. We, we speak curse, we speak angry things over people because we have made them an enemy. Don't do that. And yes, this happens in the church. <laughs> Grandstanding, he says, don't, don't try to just like gather people to your own thing and you, you speak to only the people that you know are gonna, right, are gonna come to your side, right, so you can garner support for yourself and you gather a little army of people who are gonna, you know, support you, right, in, in, your, in your thing. Promoting half truths. Oh, did you hear? Oh, did you? Yes, well, what I heard. Well, I heard they were, yeah. Half truths, right? Spreading rumors, spreading lies. Half truth is just a nice way of saying lie. If it's not fully true, it's not true. Don't, don't do that. Don't promote those things. It's not about each other, right? In any way that will make things worse and harder for us to talk about these things. This is a hard one. I think we need to be careful, right? Because we as Christians, we, we need to look, we're supposed to look to the Bible, right? as a resource, as, our, as the, the word of God. But when he, when he says be careful about avoiding scripture quoting, because a lot of times what we do is we have one particular position and we find a scripture that may even be taken out of context and we use that scripture to say, well, did you know the Bible says? Right, it's almost like a gunslinger kind of thing, right? It's like, you know, we're standing, right? And we're kind of like facing off like this and it's like, who can pull out the scripture faster? Well, gotcha. <laughs> What can you say now, right? And then the other person's like, Ugh, and as he's falling down, he's like, but what about Matthew, whatever? And he's like, right? We, we kind of just fling scriptures, like, be careful about that, because that is not the way scripture is to be used. <laughs> Character association, right? Oh, you are a registered Democrat, so you must fill in the blank. Oh, you're a registered Republican, so you must... And then we kind of pile on, depending on what we think about that, then we kind of pile on association with that kind of thing. And we say, oh, you must be like this. You must support this. You must. And we decide whether we can be friends with this person or not. This is one that Dan Boone didn't mention, but this is one that, I, that, that was on my heart that I wanted to mention. Be very careful about pulling the God told me card. Be very careful about pulling the God told me card. Does God speak to us through his word, through his spirit, through other people? Does God speak? Yes or no? Yes, he does. Can God speak to you? Yes. Well, when we are talking about very difficult things, we need to be careful. I'm not saying don't ever say, God's, I believe God said this to me. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is be careful when we say this, because many times when we say this, it can come across as God told me this. So if you disagree with me, you are not just disagreeing with me. Who are you disagreeing with? And how dare you, right? <laughs> disagree with God on this particular thing. So we need to be careful how we use this against each other to say, well, God told me. So what do you have to say about that now? Are you going to disagree with God, right? We, we use this to prove our point and maybe sometimes to convince ourselves why we are in the right. Have you ever found yourself doing any or all of these things? I'll be the first one to admit I have. In your interactions, even with other Christ followers, I think Dan Boone is wise to warn us against these pitfalls. 
So great, those are some of the things that we should not be doing. How do we engage in a way that the apostles encouraged us through their letters to the early Christians? How do we engage with an attitude that is like that of Jesus Christ? Or how do we engage in what John Wesley called holy conversation? In case you're not familiar, John Wesley is commonly known as the co-founder of Methodism, which eventually became the denomination known as Methodist. And the Church of the Nazarene itself is a part of the John Wesleyan holiness tradition. So you will find a lot of John Wesley's tradition, uh, theology in the doctrine of Trinity's denomination, this church, we as a church. Okay? John Wesley committed his life as a Christian to the pursuit of holy devotion. And he believed that Christians in this life can attain a state where the love of God reigns supreme in our hearts, called holiness. When you think holiness, you think I'm walking around on a cloud and I'm perfect and I just kind of like shoot sunbeams out of my eyes or something like that, okay? Holiness to John Wesley meant that you have gotten to a place where the love of God reigns, reigns supreme in your heart. Who does not want the love of God to reign supreme in their heart, to have God's love fully filling your being and your life? As a Christian, that's our greatest desire, that God's love would reign supreme in our hearts, enabling us, empowering us to live holy lives. So in other words, we, we, don't, we don't not sin because we're trying really hard. We, we run from sin. We run toward God's way because, because God's love has been made complete in our hearts. We love God so much. Why would I want to do? All right, so this is what John Wesley brought to the world. This idea, not really to bring the idea, starting the Bible, but anyway. So there were certain things that John Wesley believed and taught. He took from the scriptures, which were works of grace, ways of experiencing God's grace. And it's important that he called them works of grace because these are things that we can't earn. They're good gifts that come from a good, good God. So here are some of the, the works of grace that John Wesley talked about. Prayer, scripture reading, fasting, communion. These are all ways that someone could experience God's grace. And included in this list of ex- this experience, of, holy com- uh, this experience of, of grace is a holy conversation or holy conferencing, as John Wesley called it. So think about that. We experience God's grace when we enter into holy conversation, Christ-like conversation with fellow Christians. I don't know about you, but I want to experience as much of God's grace as I can. I certainly know I need to. So this is a great incentive to want to practice this holy conversation rather than to allow fights to erupt or to run from conflict altogether. So what does it look like, this holy conversation? Here are some explanations from pastors who have tried this. What does holy conversation look like? How have they been able to kind of master this art of having holy conversation and do, experiencing God's grace by doing that? <clears throat> Here's what some pastors have said who have tried this way of holy conversation. Christians who have gathered together to discuss difficult topics in their church or in their body and agreeing that they're not going to let it devolve into arguing or avoiding. One pastor said, holy conferencing became really important as we gathered at the table to listen to all the reasons why we should or should not move forward with this topic. When there, were, would, be, when there would be a conflict or some tension or a variety of opinions, we would commit to listening to each other, and approaching each other with grace as much as possible. We always remember that we, listen to this, we always remember that we have a place to stand together even if we don't end up in the same place at the end of the conversation. That is huge. Let me read that again. We always remember that we have a place, we have a place to stand together even if we don't end up in the same place at the end of the conversation. Can you recognize that today, church, with your brothers and sisters here in Christ? You have a place to stand. It's on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. That is where we stand. Even if, even when, I should say, because we're going to not agree always on things, even when we don't end up at the same place at the end of the conversation. Another pastor said, in our culture today, there is so much divisiveness that it's really important to call ourselves to that means of grace. Particularly people in the United States understand how uncivil conversation and discussion have become. People desire something different, and in general society, there's a fair amount of conversation about civil discourse. As Christians, we have a number of scripture passages and admonitions in terms of how to treat one another, which we just read. And one more pastor said this, it's not just about an exchange of opinions. 
It's a real attempt to move forward toward a common understanding of God's will and intention toward us, Christians. It's a holy thing to be undertaken with seriousness and integrity. It's an opportunity to build on the trust that's already there and to allow people to seek together for the truth. <clears throat> so here's what one Methodist minister did. They boiled it down to eight things holy conversation can look like based in Scripture. First, every person here in this conversation is a child of God. That, that one right there should clear up a lot of things, right? Child of God, and not only that, but we are made in the image of God. You have the image of God stamped on you. So even if Aaron and I are really butting heads on something, right, and we are, we're, I, I mean, I cannot see things from your perspective, and you're not trying to see things from my perspective, we're really going at it. What is one thing that can immediately cause me to see Aaron not as my enemy, not as this person that I have to try to overcome? When I look at Aaron, I remember, you're made in the likeness and image of God, just like I am. You were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, just like I am. You're a child of God, just as I am. He is our father. We are brothers. I can't hate you. How can I hate you? How can I resolve that I'm either going to destroy you or avoid you? My brother, child of God. Second, this is basic, right? The Bible talks about this being, being slow to anger and slow to speak, but quick to listen, right? Listen before speaking. Basic, but how many of us fail in this? I have. How many of you have failed in this in your interpersonal relationships? And your, how many spouses have ever failed in this? Failing to listen before we speak. I have. Number three, strive to understand from another point of view. Strive means you actually try. We can easily say, well, I don't get it. I don't understand how you think that way. Are you, are you trying to, though? Do you even want to understand why someone else thinks the way that they do? Are you working toward that understanding? Number four, strive to reflect accurately the views of others. Going back to the, the don'ts, right? Don't take what somebody says and then say, oh, so that means you're up. Oh, so I guess you're just, right, putting words in somebody's mouth, making assumptions, taking what they say and then blowing it out of proportion or out of context or out, right? Saying, saying something that they're not saying. Okay, what I hear you saying is, and reflect it back to them accurately, not according to your emotions or opinions. Number five, disagree without being disagreeable. How do you disagree in a disagreeable way? What are some things that you can do? You know, you ever heard a body language, right? Everybody, everybody show me a face that you might make when you are disagreeing with somebody in a disagreeable way. What, what face might you make at somebody when you're disagreeing with them in a disagreeable way? Show, show me, show me a, who, who can make really good faces? Come on. Roll your eyes at them. Right? What else? What else you got? Come on, somebody make, make your face. Make a face. Show me a really good angry face. Like somebody's telling you something and you're like, oh, I'll just give me a nasty look. Right? <laughs> we all know how to do this, right? We know how to show, even if we don't say it, even if we don't say it, you're stupid. Just one look on your face. Can show that I'm disagreeing with you, but I'm doing it in a disagreeable way. And there's so many words just in that one face, isn't there? We have to resist that. Disagree, yes. But do it in an agreeable way, not in a disagreeable way. Speak about issues. Do not defame people. Very important. Somebody who disagrees with you, don't resort to name calling, to labeling. Okay, we disagree on this issue, but I am not going to attack your character. <laughs> now, all you need to do to find a great examples of people who are doing this wrong is uh, the people running for governor right now, right? The, the commercials that are going around, okay? Whenever there's an election, right? So-and-so is like the greatest person in the world, and he's going to fix everything. But this person, right, and every this screen goes like black and white, and the music gets all dark. <laughs> Right? And they pick like the most unflattering picture of that person where they're like, you know, they've got this kind of face, right? And you're like, oh, I don't want to vote for that guy or that person, right? 
That's what they do. And they just attack, like, this person is this, and he's horrible, and he's made all these mistakes. Right? It's like showing a highlight film of, of one, your favorite athlete, where it looks like they're the greatest person in the world, where you didn't show all the times when they missed and all the times they made mistakes, right? Don't defame people. You could disagree about issues. Um, when you are in these conversations, and this is, I would say, and I, I love that these are the last two things that it says because these are foundational, right? This is what you should be doing before, during, after you have difficult conversations. Pray, 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 pray. And as you come into God's presence and as you pray, humble yourself. I need to humble myself. Pray, pray, God help me, God help me. God, if you need to say it a hundred times, God help me. Pray in silence or aloud before you make any decisions. Pray. And I love that it says, number eight, it says, let prayer interrupt your busyness. Yeah, but we gotta have a meeting. We gotta, make, we gotta come to a decision, right? We have, to, we have to come to a decision on this thing. We got business to take care of. We have to decide what our church is gonna say about this or what we're gonna do about this. Can you let prayer, can you let God, let God, God's already there, right? But can, can you allow God Almighty, who sees and knows and who loves, and God's kingdom to break into that conversation that you're having, to show you something, to say something that you may not be seeing or hearing? It's not going to happen if you just talk, 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 talk. Sometimes when we're having difficult conversations, we see, okay, you know what? I'm, I feel I'm getting, my emotions are running high. Can we just stop for a minute? Can we pray? Because I feel like, I feel like my blood's really starting to boil. And I don't want to hit you, and I don't want this to end badly. I just want to hear from God. There's lots of times that I, 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 I wish I would do this with, with, with my wife, with Gloria. You know, when emotions are really running high, we're fighting, and I wish I would just, I wish I would just shut up, first of all sometimes, rather than having to have the last little word. But I wish that I would just shut up and say, okay, God, help me be humble right now. Help me not to feel like I have to win this. Like I have to, like I have to defeat her. <laughs> help me be humble to see things the way that you do. Imagine for a few moments with me Imagine what the church could look like, not just Trinity Church, but the church in America, the church around the world. Imagine what the church could look like, what the church could become if everyone agreed to do this when we disagree. If everyone would agree to do this. Imagine what the church could be like. Apparently, it's happening somewhere. My prayer is that we would continue to see it happening more and more here among us, in our families, in our staff, in our board meetings, in our Sunday school classes, in our small group meetings, you know, putting this together with what the scripture instructs us, we should begin to see what is most important. When we feel strongly about things, when we've gathered all the facts and the information about the topics that matter, when we are greatly concerned about a certain issue, it is easy to believe that getting those things across are the most important. And don't get me wrong, your convictions, your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs that you have are important. And God is probably saying something through those, but what is the most important to Jesus Christ, and therefore the most important to us as his body, is unity. Maintaining the unity that we have in Christ. Jesus Christ prayed in John 17 for those who would believe, for us. He's prayed that they may all be one. If you're going to fight, fight for that. Fight for that unity. If you're going to stand up, stand up for that unity that we have in Christ. Yes, there are atrocities being committed in our world, in our country. Yes, the world, need, the church needs to wake up to the reality of the world that we live in, to stand up and do something about the tragedies that we see every day. Yes, the church needs to do so much more than just to offer thoughts and prayers, more than just holding meetings to discuss these issues. God is calling the church into action. But think about it this way. Friends, how much more effective will we be in conquering the giants that we face when we are marching together as one? How much more effective will we be rather than marching divided, bitter, hard-hearted? How much more effective?
effective could we be, church? In closing, I want to say that there are times for fighting. And there are times for avoiding. I pray that your heart and your mind are open to God in such a way that you will know when those times are. That together we will know when those times are. Is immediate action needed? And there isn't time or opportunity to sit around and talk about it. Well, if God is moving you, then move. And may your movement be empowered by the very Holy Spirit of God. Is God prompting your heart to stay quiet about something? That it would be best to wait for emotions to settle, for heads to cool off. By all means, don't force the issue until the time is right, until God's timing. I am sensing, though, that in the life of Trinity Church, perhaps God is calling us to engage in some holy conversation right now. And let's not assume that we know what others are thinking. Let's not assume that our viewpoints are the ones that matter the most. And let's please, please remember, as 1 Corinthians 12, 25 reminds us, that we as the body of Christ are only as strong as each of us has equal concern and respect for one another. We're only as strong as we have equal concern and respect for each other. This is the way of Christ. This is the attitude of Christ. This is the only way for Christ's body to be Would you pray with me? Let's spend a few moments just repenting, repenting, ask God to forgive us, to repent, to ask God, God, turn me around and and show show me the path that you want me to be on. Show me the way that Christ, that Christ is reflected in this through me. God, I repent of the ways that I have allowed hard-heartedness, divisiveness, bitterness to seep into my heart. I repent of the ways that I have labeled, the ways that I have demeaned, the ways that I have tried to force into boxes, the ways that I have spoken angry words or curses, the ways that I have made enemies out of those who disagree with me. Even those whom I would call brother and sister in Christ. Can we as a church just repent? And maybe, maybe you haven't ever done this. Maybe you are above this. But even if you are, would you just repent Can we just repent right now on behalf of the church, capital C, God's people? I don't think I'm alone in seeing that this happens all the time. God, we repent. We repent on behalf of Trinity Church in any ways that we have done this, that we have chosen argument or avoidance, fight or flight when you are calling us to enter into holy conversation as a way of experiencing your grace. God, we repent of the ways that we as a church have allowed ourselves to become divided, to hate, to curse, to disassociate. God, we repent that we have not reflected you of our slander, of our bitterness. We repent, God. We humble ourselves at your feet, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, show us the most excellent way. Show us the way to this holy place, this holy conversation where we experience your grace and where we help each other experience your grace. We need this, God, and I, and I want to see, I know, I want to see so many of us, we want to see, we are praying for this, our leadership, our staff, our board, people who have invested in Trinity for years and years and years. We want to see unity among us. And unity of heart and mind. Not just lip service, not just outwardly, but God, we want to see unity in the deepest parts of us. So that even when we disagree, we are resolved. We are not going to let it go there. 
this unity that was, that was paid for on the cross that you said was what caused the, the dividing wall of hostility to come down. When you tore the veil of separation, when you, the kingdom of God, broke into this world and is breaking into this world still today, God, that's what we want to see. Open our hearts, soften our hearts so that we can see you. Thank you, God, for this call that you've given us today. As difficult as it is, this is what you are calling us to be. This is who you are calling us to be. May we never settle for anything else. Thank you, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. closing, uh, Monique and I are going to share uh, a song with you. And An's going to join us on the, uh, the drum box. This song just speaks of this song speaks of God being our faithful uh, rock and the one that we cry out to um, when we feel at the end of ourselves and that he truly is where our hope is found. He is the hope for us. He's the hope for our, our church. He knows what we need.
Lord, I pray a blessing over each one of us as we go. Lord, may we go into this, this, uh, this new week encouraged, um, Lord, and by your spirit empowered uh, to live a life that reflects Jesus Christ, um, to live a life that reflects your love, your gentleness, your grace, your truth, your holiness. And I pray that we would start by interacting with each other, um, to be sensitive to where each one of us is and to approach each other with that desire to understand, to know, to connect, and to build toward the unity that you made us for. Lord, we, I look forward to hearing what may come out of this, that you are moving hearts, that you are moving lives, that you're moving people to, to this, and that we will grow in the unity that you have made us for, because that's who you are. We love you, God, so much, and we thank you for first loving us, for all that you have done for us. May we never cease to sing your praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you soon.